have life goals. Things we need and want to do. Sometimes, things get in the way of our goals. Life events can make our goals seem impossible. I love gardening, but it's difficult because I have arthritis. I want to drive my car, but I couldn't after my stroke. I need to find a job, but it's been challenging since being diagnosed with schizophrenia. I want to make new friends, but it's hard because I have autism. I need to get dressed in the morning, but I just had a hip replacement and can't bend forward. I have difficulty managing my responsibilities because of my anxiety disorder. I haven't been able to ride my bicycle since I had a brain injury. I need to do my grocery shopping, but it's difficult to remember when I have dementia. It's tough to care for my baby because of my carpal tunnel syndrome. I need to walk my dog, but I have multiple sclerosis. I want to learn the guitar, but my right arm is amputated. I had a spinal cord injury, but I want to live on my own. My occupational therapist helped me to achieve this goal. Occupational therapists help people to find the tools and strategies they need to overcome barriers such as illness and disability and reach their goals. Now I live on my own. I'm learning the guitar. I can walk my dog. I can care for my baby again. I am able to do my grocery shopping on my own. I can ride my new special bike. I am working on managing my responsibilities. Now I can dress myself. I'm making new friends. I'm working with my OT to find the right job for me. My OT helped me to drive again. I have a garden now. Because of occupational therapy, I can oh, yeah. We're going to talk about the centennial vision for occupational therapy. So this 2016 centennial vision is we envision that occupational therapy is a powerful, widely recognized, science-driven, evidence-based profession with a globally connected and diverse workforce meeting society's occupational needs. So there was an example of a visionary, and a visionary is someone who can see the future and can make changes that are needed to meet the needs of a society. Um, Apple's vision of the knowledge navigator in 1987 led to go forward into the iPhone and some of the technology that Apple has created and we can definitely say that Steve Jobs was a visionary. So they fostered the development of that portable wireless flat screen computers, mobile devices both activated by voice and touch, as well as personal data managers, video conferencing, and also finding out how to data mine and retrieve data. So when we imagine the future and create a vision, what we are doing is setting in motion circumstances that, because of our imagination and our creativity, can become a reality. Gandhi was a visionary. He led changes that, that, were, that continue to persist to this day. Think about how many people that you see wearing Gandhi t-shirts. Um, he really spoke to people and uh, really was a visionary. So imagine a world different than the one that you now inhabit. So shaping the centennial vision, what must the profession of occupational therapy do during the next years to become better so for the world of 2017 and even beyond that? So sometimes there are some mistakes that happen when looking to the future, just making predictions, um, just extrapolating current trends, overestimating the influence of short-term trends, underestimating the influence of long-term change, and thinking only of one possible scenario for the future. 
So what we know, especially in the profession of occupational therapy, that change is con constant. In the present age, change is not incremental, it's exponential. And that no one can really predict the future, but we can anticipate the course of known trends. So we know that things are going to change. And in fact, as my career as an occupational therapist, things have changed quite a bit. When I first started seeing patients years ago in a nursing home after they had had a hospitalization, people could receive up to three months of OT and PT and speech uh, after a uh, hospitalization. There was no managed care for a while. What that means is, is that there weren't organizations that were looking at dollars that were spent and dis making decisions on whether or not somebody could go to a hospital or receive therapy services. So managed care has come into in, in the other big change that's happened over my course as a therapist is something called capitated case rates, which is where based on somebody's condition, the therapist gets X number of dollars to treat them, whether they treat them one time or 10 times. So these are all some changes that have happened and changes are continuing to occur in the profession. So we don't know things that are happening, and, and as the great example of, of course, when the towers came down, that was cert certainly nothing that anyone had anticipated. The stock market crash of, 20, of 1929, the attack of Pearl Harbor, shooting of Martin Luther King, the onset of HIV and AIDS, the fall of the Soviet Union, and again, those 9-11 attacks. So therapeutic positioning and strategic sense, we have to consider where the OT profession is now, anticipate where the public needs are as the future continues to grow. We have to figure out what services should be provided by occupational therapists and then make sure that we can address the needs that are existing and take steps to be prepared as a profession to provide those services. So as Wayne Gretzky said, is we need to skate to where the puck is going to be. So we have to anticipate as best we can as a profession where the needs are going to be. We have to under identify and understand trends and take steps to shape future events. So the point is not to really predict the future, but to prepare for it and try to shape it. So there are some current profile of emerging trends in practice. So there are therapists that are working in community agencies now that were not options before. There are therapists that are working in, uh, that have cash-based practices that they didn't have before. There are therapists that work in assisted living facilities. There are more therapists that are working in mental health. So there are a lot of emerging areas of practice for occupational therapists. So this was way back in 2005. At that point there were about 82,000 OTs and about 20,000 OTAs and about 100,000 practitioners. The workforce has continued to grow and uh, now reaches about 300,000. So you can see that over the past years of, of um, just the steady growth of the profession. So again, way back in, in 2005, there were about 13% of OTs working in skilled nursing facilities, 31% in the school system, 13% in a hospital, about 10% working in academia, um, rehab, community-based, private practice, and outpatient. So we do know, again, like I said, there's some emerging areas of OT practice. So ergonomics consulting, designing accessibility consulting and home modification, driver assessment and training, consulting to an assisted living facility, uh, wheelchair modifications and measurements, assisting with technology and assisted device, health and wellness co consulting and, and even wellness coaching, low vision rehabilitation, Alzheimer's disease, addressing, of course, the needs of children and youth, and in community services and agencies. So some of the drivers that are, that are creating change are the aging population. People are living longer. 
We also know that people seek out information on the internet as well as the are changing avenues of work and, and people are more savvy now. They know what they want and they know what's available to them. The diversity of the population uh, is changing as well. There is, we know that there's more stress and depression because of some of the economic trends that have happened and downturns. We also know that there are changes in lifestyle values and there's sometimes even a trend now to simplify. And then one of the biggest drivers of change is the cost of health care and reimbursement issues and making sure that the care that's provided to our patients is efficacious and what that means is is that it's proven that it works that we don't do things just because we've always done them and in your readings this week it talked about the importance of evidence-based practice and that's something that you'll hear constantly throughout this program so we know that again the population by 2020 that the population of baby boomers is really going to grow and you can see that the that there's going to be a greater influx of elderly population by the time that we reach 2020. So the nice thing about universal design is it recognizes that people are different and that it is adaptable and some of the things that are um, being created nowadays with 3D printers uh, are just amazing and can really be helpful to our patients. We do know that this is definitely that people are always on their computers and their smartphones and that people have technology available to them. And, and in practice, you'll find out that a lot of patients have already looked up things to find out what's the best care for their condition. There's also a changing world of work. So there's uh, new types of work. There are there's people that work for home from home now. There's job sharing. There's change changes in management, and there's also that increased after the economic downturn that a lot of people are finding that they're working uh, that they might be working what used to take two people to do the work are now doing it by one people. So we also are seeing more cultural diversity in the United States, uh, that very many of our citizens now are not born in the U.S., and the Hispanic population continues to grow and will actually increase from to 55 million by 2020. We're also finding there's more stress-related disorders. So we know that, that stress leads to an increase in cortisol, which can lead to increased weight gain and difficulty sleeping and, and many health issues. So chronic stress can, like I said, cause obesity or weight gain, osteoporosis, depression, ulcers, substance abuse. And that's by a study that was done by Van Talley in 2002. So we know that, that people that are undergoing stress need some stress management techniques in their lives. And occupational therapists can be beneficial in teaching how to manage stress and, and teaching how to be more mindful. So here's a book by Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is kind of a, re, a very fun kind of book that talks about the relationship between stress disease and the importance of knowing how to utilize coping skills effectively. So about uh, in 2002, about 26% of Americans had a mental health disorder. Uh, Two-thirds of those cases ha were moderate or severe. And basically, a lot of those people did not get treated by professionals. So another emerging area is assistive technologies and smart home monitoring. And I think anybody who's been watching television lately has seen the commercials for that. You can want monitor your home through the use of your smartphone or your cell phone. And we also know that there are emerging areas in terms of uh, electric stimulation of muscles to promote movement and implants and tissue regeneration and all of these are scientific trends that will help our patients in the future. So 
again, just knowing that some of the things that are that we never thought would be possible are now making giant strides. And I personally have was watching a presentation one time of a, a plastic surgeon who was talking about the fact that if someone had lost an ear due to a burn or something, that they can actually regenerate one and do tissue transplants now. Very fascinating technology. So we know that people are constantly looking at lifestyle and what's important to them. So there's less interest in, in um, working hard and not having an appropriate balance between the quality of life and, and the importance of relaxation. And people realize that it's important, more important to have work balance. Whether they achieve it or not is a different story. So we do know that there are increased percentage of, of, we talked about this before, alcohol use, osteoarthritis, and other degenerative disabling issues. And all of these things really um, can change somebody's lifestyle and of certainly their quality of life. And occupational therapists can help with a number of these, these issues. We talked about the fact that the number of men at Benefair Medicare beneficiaries will continue to grow and the number of people that Medicare serves will approximately double by the year of 2030. So we also know that individuals that are limited in activities because of chronic conditions will continue to increase as the individuals get older and many of those people need the services of occupational therapists. What we do know is that Medicare is currently in, in a continuous battle of trying to figure out ways to reduce costs. And one of the things that they've implemented, that they're starting to implement, is hospitals getting paid for the provision of services for a total hip or a total knee, that the hospital gets paid for the surgery, and they get paid for the hospital stay, and they also have to manage 60 days of services for the beneficiary, whether it be inpatient or outpatient or rehab, etc. So they're, they're bundling payments in, a, in an effort to cut costs in the future. So we basically know that we need to continue, that the healthcare system is con constantly changing and we want to make sure that OT is part of that. So we know that there is, um, there is sometimes an underuse of services and there's also an overuse of services provided sometimes. And so we have to figure out that balance of who needs care and who doesn't and how do we manage that. So what we do know is, is that, we, that a lot of diseases are chronic and that people are not going to get better. And what happens is, is that perhaps they need intervention from time to time, but not continuous, uh, continuous intervention. We're also seeing a call for more interdisciplinary care that nowadays, because uh, practitioners worked, nurses worked with other nurses, and there really wasn't a lot of interdisciplinary care, and, and many facilities are now working in a more interdisciplinary um, approach to provision of care. So some recommendations were to try to avoid injuries, to promote evidence-based practice, one of the aims of evidence-based practice is to provide effective care that's based on patient values and that patient values guide decision making. We also want to make sure the interventions are timely and efficient and that care doesn't really vary based upon gender or ability to pay sometimes. So we, we, the readings talked about the importance of evidence-based practice and one of the ways that we can provide evidence-based practice and how this ties so much into what we're learning this semester is that evidence, the way that we can prove that something works is to measure it. And by using a measurable outcome measure and, and showing how our patients or our clients changed over time with occupational therapy, we are able to produce evidence to show the distinct value of occupational therapy. So 
one, a question that we have are, are today's emerging areas of practice aligned with the needs that are going to be present in the year 2020? We don't know for certainty, but we do know that by planning that we can help to create a future. Thanks, um, and enjoy the readings this week, and if you have any questions, uh, please make sure that you email me, and we will also and make sure that, you're, uh, that you've done your discussion and responded to another of your classmates' posts before, the, before Sunday evening. Have a great week.